in a strange country, in a country that's not yours, where you're not born and brought, and then you're living amongst my population. The population is very, very different to you. And I don't, I never felt unwelcome. At the same time, I never felt welcome. Welcome to the Global Indian Podcast, the world's greatest journey and the official platform for people of Indian origin. Because let's face it, we are everywhere. Welcome back to The Voyage. This is season two, episode three of a two-part special with a remarkable individual, Vijay Patel. This podcast has been supported by our dear friends at ShareMe.com, the app for all your beauty, fitness and wellness needs. Now, as you know, my name is Rajan Nazran and I explore. For over a decade, I've traveled the globe, piecing together the kaleidoscope that is our community. I've been held hostage, faced Ebola and met extraordinary individuals, often in destinations that would surprise you. In this season, I'm joined by my dear friends from around the globe as we take you on a voyage for the ears and plunge into the human experience of being a person of Indian origin, take a closer look at the countries we now call home and tackle the big issues that we ought to know. This two-part special is a conversation with an incredible individual whose own personal voyage is a testimony that all is possible. In this conversation, we're back in London speaking with entrepreneur and philanthropist Vijay Patel who opens up about his remarkable upbringing from being born in Kenya to the changing tides he faced in the UK and the greatest inspiration of his life, his mother, a person who overcame the harshest of realities and was a custodian of this concept of Indianness, and importantly, his own actions helped mold Vijay into the entrepreneur he's become today. It's a very touching tribute to a remarkable and very special human being who despite rising up to the stratospheres of achievements and having all the trappings of success surrounding that, has always kept her integrity and humanistic values all the way up until the end. Something that has always been the cornerstone of BJ's family success as well. As always, you can find out more about the Global Indian series at the end of the podcast. Now, if you are listening to this via Podbean, make sure you subscribe so you do not miss part two. And if by YouTube, ensure you like and subscribe to our channels. The Global Indian Series ensures that you keep up to date with all our latest podcasts and also you get to browse through the stories so far. I hope you enjoy this session. And just move. It's, it's a conversation between friends, and I think it's... You know, she's a very interesting lady, that one in uh, Uruguay. Yeah? Yeah, vegetarian, and a chef, and cooking beef every morning, <laughs> but not eating it, which is great. And it's a paradox of being global Indians, right? It's, yeah, yeah, and, she, and she swapped her corporate desk in Mumbai to go oh, yes. set up in Venezuela, in a, a Uruguay. Uruguay, yeah. It's, but that's not anything dissimilar to you because I think the thing that really fascinates me, okay, look, you, you, you've been financially successful. I think the whole world knows about that. But the real story is that you're this global Indian who said, again, what if? And you left from, you're born in Kenya and then you came to the UK at a time that was incredibly painful for immigrants. And you've almost, and you've been able to go across this kaleidoscope before I have, looking at the world meeting with other people and you've almost seen a very different generation of growth i'm one generation ahead of you Rajan. yeah you are <laughs> you bj what's it like to be you ran us through right at the start you you came to the uk when you're as a teen but before that you're in kenya let, let me tell you my first impression yeah my first impression i flew in on a 707 boeing 707 i remember so so the little the lufthansa airline anyway and when we approached London, I looked at it from above. And the, it was the first time I had flown, you know, and, and I saw these little houses, rows of houses as you fly over London, you know. 
And I said, oh my God, I've got all that open land and I just see little, tiny little, you know, Meccano bricks put on top of each other and people live in there. Everything is all in a row. The roads are there next to that. Little gardens there. And I said, what the hell have I come to from being an, in a country where everything was open. You walk 50 yards and you are in the green fields and, you know. And I thought, how am I going to adapt to this? And that was my first impression. I said, I've come to a dinky toyland here, you know. <laughs> but uh, there's not a lot of choice. I had a bag full of clothes. Well, a suitcase full of clothes, five pounds in my pocket, and an amazing amount of wanting to get on in life, you know. Just uh, so much ambition there was that you know, I had to, where I, what I had left behind, this is a beautiful place where I was living, but I left back a lot of poverty, personal poverty, because, you know, my father had passed away when I was five brought up by a very austere, lovely, lovely mother, who was very strong, a very strong personality, uh, who believed, despite not having a penny, she believed that, you know, in UK, you can work go, and then go to school as well. And she had learned that from people who she had spoken to, had come back from here, or, you know, people who knew that you could do that. My mom had no idea you could do that, but she, she bought that story and said, okay, son, look, I haven't got any money. She brought us up with amazing values, you know. Even while she was earning equivalent of today's money, 15 pounds a month, the first 10% of her money, which was one pound 50 equivalent, went to charity. Wow. Till the... One pound and fifty pence equivalent and the fifty-first penny did not arrive. We were not allowed to touch that money. Because my mom said, Look, you haven't got a father, but I'm equivalent of your mom and dad. I'm both in one. You're getting food every day. I'm here to protect and look after you. There are thousands of children who are real orphans who haven't got the next meal. And this money we are keeping here every day is for those kids. And we have to be very thankful to God that we have got this every day, a meal, which these people don't have. So every, every month should get this money off to India <laughs> to feed children in an orphanage. <laughs> That's my mom. <laughs> and and you, you, at that time you were in Kenya, wasn't you? Yes, in Eldoret, in a little town of Eldoret, which is in the highlands of Eldoret. It's 7,000 feet nearly we were living up at. So the climate was almost ideal they they claim to have the best climate in the world because you are on a mountain yeah in a on the top on equator so normally equator is very hot but you are seven thousand feet up so normally the temperature did go much over 25 degrees right through the year and the sun rose came rose at six set at six 12 hours sunlight and that was right through the year it is amazing place if you read about it they claim still even today if you go there outside the town center outside the town when you enter he says welcome to eldoret the best climate in the world <laughs> how, really how, how, how did your parents end up there my father like all the indians was a commercial immigrant what happened is he went there in the late 30s mid 30s late 30s yeah to work he got married and then, you know, India, there wasn't anything, and the things were not really good at all. So to better himself, he was an educated, matriculated, educated, nothing. He was in new numbers, accounts, this, that, and the other. And so he got himself to Africa and found himself a job. And the first job he did was in an outlet, in a shop, but looking after the books. He was a accountant kind of chap. I think he worked in the shop as well because their outfits are very, very small. So he worked in the shop and also kept the books for the owner of the business. But he was like, you know, I think our entrepreneurial blood comes from my mother. More because I, she, she was more around and my dad was an entrepreneur as well. You know, he soon went in his own business. He, he went to Tanzania and then he came to Nairobi, Kenya, where he went to business. And... Uh, how we ended up in Eldred, that's where I, we were bred. I was born in Nairobi, but at the age of three or four, we traveled. My dad moved to Eldred because he had a business and his family in India, one of the brothers died. So he went back there. And in those days, travel was very slow. You want to go in a boat. 
and then you come back, it's three months journey. It was never like a week, yeah? By the time he came, his part was running his business, and there's no business, he all gone, kaput, finish. So my dad left with a fair amount of debt and went to Alberta again, working as a clerk. He worked there for, as a bookkeeper or an accountant for 1953 to 1955, three, two and a half, three years, and started his own business again as a timber merchant. Because he had it in his blood, you know. Yeah. So he would, actually, there's a lot of trees and jungles there when we were in the islands. So he used to cut those jungles and export the timber to, to low lands like Nairobi and Mombasa and Dar es Salaam. You know, that, that's, he started very successfully. And well, as the luck would have it, in 1956, within a year of starting the business, he died. What was Living. it like? What was it like for your family then at that moment in time? Because he would have been progressing. Then all of a sudden, yeah, your suddenly father nothing, away. zero, yeah. zero income, very little saving because my dad had only been in business for a year. And my mom, who was not particularly literate like an average lady in those times, uh, left in a complete shock. But one, my mom had that sense to say, "Look, I'm not going back to India," because my dad was providing for our family in India from Africa. And she said, if I go back there, look, there's nothing there, and I can't go to nothing to nothing to add to. So she said, I'm going to stay here and look after my kids, and I'll, I'll find a way of working. And she started a kindergarten to teach children A, B, C, and one, two, three, like in a little garden, kindergarten in, in our house. And, and that, you know, my mom, despite not being particularly educated, she's a very strong minded human being. And, you know, all my qualities, and my grit comes from my mom, meaning I do not give up easily. I work my bollocks off. And all this, and charity, you see? My mom was very yeah. strong in charity, very strong on hard work, very strong on honesty. And all this she installed in us. You see, there wasn't much humility there to have anyway, because you know, we, were, we were right at the bottom. But she taught yeah. us on honesty and integrity and charity. These things are very strong. Right through life, uh, honestly, Rajan, I can't say more. She has done that. She installed these three things in us. She was never unhappy if you worked hard. She says, Beta, this is translate exactly what she said. You'll understand it in uh, Hindi. Beta, I'm Raja Lok to Heni. I'm to Karnai Padiga. To Thagya and Beta, Chal Thoda Aram Karle, Roti Khatar, Fir Wapi Jara Kam Pra. I'm Raja Maharaj Hode to Alag Bathoti Beta. You know, that was her thesis. She would yeah. never say, Jal, never, 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 never. In the end, when I was, she knew that things were okay for me, she would say, now, you pass it on. You don't have to do this. You don't have to do that. Why do you have to work so hard? But that was only in the last few years of her life. She just passed away six months ago, at the age of 98. My, my condolences. And just to make a point here that we were brought up, between my brother and I, myself, we brought up by a very stern, very hardworking, a lady who installed these amazing qualities in us. And I hope I never let her down. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's, so when, when she said to you and your brother, okay, you're going to the UK, you're going to study there, did she send you by yourself or did she come along yes, with you? Yes, yes, yes. No, 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 no. She came back after because who had the fares to come? I worked nine months to collect one way fare to come to England. Wow. <laughs> what, what was, I was it paid like? What was like it? 300 shillings. And the yeah. fare was 2,700 rupees shillings, nine months salary. What was it like for you? Because you're leaving behind Kenya, which is your home, but you're also leaving behind your mom, who's been your rock. Yes. It's very hard, very hard and worrying. But my mom, again, she, she was an entrepreneur. I knew she would, I didn't have to send her any money because she said, you don't worry about me. I've made life livelihood for 20 years after your papa died, and I'll carry on. And uh, so that the, we didn't, I didn't have the responsibility of running my mom's home in Kenya, but or Bikul for that matter. She said, you look after yourself and when you're ready, I'll come. And that's exactly what happened. I went, I came here, did my A-levels. I had got, uh, by the way, I had uh, eight or so O-levels, GC. O-levels, yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. We had done this Cambridge thing, Cambridge board exams and all that. So I'd go, I had both, so came here, went to night school, exactly what mom had planned. <laughs> went to night school, got my A-levels and went to Leicester to do my school of pharmacy. And that's where I became a pharmacist. And then, you know, again, that was very fortunate in this country that you know, I got a grant. Otherwise, I've never been able to pay the fees or my keep while I was it. But anyway, you, even the grant was not that much. So I had to work in Leicester. And I used to work. Do you know Leicester at all? Yeah, yeah. You know the corn exchange where the market is? 
Okay, yeah. In the center of town, there's a pub there. I used to go and pull pints there in the evening to make money. Because the grant wasn't enough, so most evenings I would go and work in the pub. And during the vacation, I would work there every hour they would let me have. Because, you know, there's no, I never went on holiday. My entire, you know, education. <laughs> just, just because, you know, mom then, in, uh, halfway through my school of pharmacy, the reason why I went to Leicester was not because I, initially I was living in London. Yeah. I went to Leicester for two reasons. Mum was going to join me and cost of living is a lot cheaper there. Yeah. Housing is cheaper. Yeah. And mum would be able to, because of the community there, she would have company. There was things like she would want to go to the temple and that. It was all there. Because you had the cultural element there. Yeah, there was the culture thing there, full of, full of it. And what, here it what, was, in London, it was different. What year was it that you went to Leicester then? 69. Wow, okay. So, but at that moment in time, there would have still been almost a movement from the far right at that moment. Well, there was some of that, but you know what? There was the, by then, there was a fair amount of uh, Indian population that had come much earlier to work in the cotton cotton industry, not cotton dyeing and finishing industry. There were yeah. lots of them from Surat. Yeah. Lots of Indians, Gujaratis, but they were Boras, you know, from yeah. uh, Surat. And there was a nice population, and very nice people. There was a whole nice population of Indians there. And then what happened in 72, we had a big influx of people in Leicester from Uganda. Uganda. What, I was what there was, already. What was it like for you when you went in at that stage? Because you're Indian, obviously of Indian origin, but you're Kenyan. Yeah. And then you're, you're coming across people directly from India who came over on the immigrant run. No, there was no problem there because at the end of the day, you are Indian. Yeah? You're Indian. Absolutely no, there was nothing there. Absolutely no difference. You know, as soon as you meet an Indian, you came to show. You said it, you know, it's like... You know, I'm with uh, guys who were at college with me and that's how we started. You know, just the first day you meet him, I'm Vijay Patel, I'm an industry, I'm a... Sadar, you know, all these friends. Yeah. And then you know, for us to make friends, it's very easy. That's it. We have never met unless other than once, right? Yeah. And you know what? I, it's like talking to it's like talking to old buddy, you know. I Absolutely. don't feel any different. It's you know, it's like the world's largest fraternity that we have, and we don't need a handshake or anything else. There's a nod, you can see fifty shades of brown, and then you yeah. talk. So then from there, obviously you did the pharmaceutical run, you set up the business, you do well, and then obviously done the charity work. How has Indianness evolved for you? Because when we spoke before, you said you've traveled all over the globe as part of building up mm -hmm. your business and you came across the community in, in far you know, distant lands. That was that's very interesting. Before the iPhones and before this, all these modern technologies, so wherever I went and I traveled the world, you know, I did another thing. Because my wife and I, we both worked. My wife's a pharmacist too. I met her at Leicester. Yeah. So here behind me, it's me and we got married. So, we, because we were both working and purely for my ambition, because I wanted to be wealthy too quickly and distance myself from poverty. Yeah? We, so my wife supported me all the time. So we both worked full time. And as my kids were, kids were born, my mom was at home. So she looked after them when they came back from school and all that. So she was fantastic, you know, support. But, you know, we had both of us, more me than her, had a guilt that, you know what, look, I'm comfortable, but you know, my wife's not at home. I'm for the kids when they come home, this, that, and the other. Though so mom's there. And I used to say, okay, you know, how can we rectify this? So every vacation the kids had, we were out traveling. So two boys and us two, we just traveled at Easter, summer, even at Christmas, I would just travel with them and, you know, just, just pick a spot in the world and I would take them. Literally, I, they would travel the world one way and the other way and stopped everywhere in between. And we used to do that every year for many years. So my kids, by the time they were teenagers, they were seasoned travelers. So they've been to, I mean, to China, Japan, Hong Kong, this way, this side, Latin America. You name it, they've been everywhere. Tahiti, you know, you name a place. Hawaii, US, everywhere. So they traveled fair about by the time they were teenagers. Because, and then I used to spend 24 seven with them, you see, so it was perfect. And in the process, we traveled, which I hadn't done till I was in my mid twenties. And then I traveled so much. And then you know what used to happen then? This is the story we'll be interested in. Look, you know, Yellow Pages was a universal product. Yeah. Yellow Pages. So wherever we went in the hotel, let's see, is there a hotel or, or Indian restaurant? 
in the town. Ukraine, like, you know, let's have to give you an example of Barbados, we were there. And uh, that time, we looked at the yellow bridges, there were lots of hotels, because they are the people, hotels, the Boras again, who, who are from Surat. Yeah. They went from Surat to Suriname. Suriname. And from yeah, Suriname, yeah. they ended up there. Anyway, so those guys were there, and they were all doing one business. Ferrying. Ferrying meaning they get clothes. They used to get clothes from India. Maybe maybe they sold them. I didn't quite get into know how what they did. But they would go around in a car with loads of clothes. And they would have a round around the island. And they basically honestly did business in a very old fashioned way. So they had stops. Every Monday you would be in one place, second place, third place, then the rest of the week. And then a week later he'd be back in the same spot. So he would have given the clothes to these people. No money changes hands first time. And they came, they, then they would pay him every week. And that was the business. And they prospered out of it. They did very well. Comfortable people with nice cars, reasonable homes, you know. They'd all done well. So I, I met one of these gentlemen. We were walking on the seafront, you know, on the sea. And uh, with my two boys. And I saw this Indian gentleman. He's a, he's a Muslim guy, so he had this white cap on. So I said, Salam Alaikum. And he spoke to me and said, oh, I said, uh, we are from England. So he said, well, do you speak languages? I said, Gujarati. So he was so, he said, oh, la, 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 la. <laughs> you know, he's much older than me. And I said, you know, we are here for a week, uh, 10 days. He says, oh, where are you staying? I said, on the, at the Treasure Beach Hotel in uh, St. James's in Barbados. So he said, no good, yeah, who can eat any cow and who can eat any cow and eat any cow and eat any I had a car as well, I had hired a car and everything. He says, no, 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 no. I said, I asked him, is there an Indian restaurant I go to? He said, no, no Indian restaurants here. Only thing you can get is roti, roti roll. Yeah. So I said, okay, that's not something I would eat anyway. But then I said, let's. But he said, look, why don't you come home? He said, I said, no, okay, we'll, okay. I'll. He said, now, I said, okay, we'll come sometime. And then I was going to sort of walk away. He said, yeah. no, no, come now. And then, you know, it's evening and you can have dinner. I said, what? <laughs> he took me home, the whole family. And the wife said, you know, come enjoy this. And there's a big family, you know. And he said, we're going to have dinner. With you. So I said, yeah, you know, my wife's pure vegetarian. And I eat a bit of meat, but, you know, no beef and all that. He said, no, 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 we'll make it immediately. Full, full dinner. And he says to me, now, don't eat in the hotel. It's rubbish. It's not clean. <laughs> You know how you are polite and said, Yeah. Next day, five o'clock, he turns up at the hotel. He said, Chalo, roti khan. He took wow. Roti. So he meant it. So I said, You're going to, no, no, no. Your car, return it. There's a spare car in the family. You have this while you're staying. What's the point of paying $200? Yeah. He said, have this car. That kind of relationship. He took me around every relation of his in the island. And I was eating different places every day while I was there. He would even invite you for lunch. I said, dinner is enough. So then we ended up being very good friends. And I kept in touch with that old man until he passed away. Wow. I took any medicine from here. Yeah. And I said, don't buy, don't, it's very expensive, his medicine there. I said, don't buy any medicine there. Just let me know your prescription and I'll just post it to you. And every month I used to do it for years. And I met the family twice. And then when he passed away, I lost contact. And uh, I did keep in touch with the sons and things. And they didn't keep in touch much. But that was it. That was the end of it. But uh, what a lovely, I met people like this everywhere. I was in Fiji at one stage. And I met another family similar. You know, and where else? USA, there was no problem. USA, funny enough, Western Western civilization has got to them. People don't invite you home. Really? Yeah, not that much. Nothing like the warmth you have in India or where in some of these colonies. In Mauritius, I had the same experience. Very nice people. Met a family there and said, Chalo, dar, chalo, dar, chalo. You know, and my children then, you know, because they wanted to enjoy the hotel and said, Daddy, don't you agree with that? Because we're not coming. <laughs> <laughs> They used to get bored, you see. And yeah. I'm like the guy who, can, who just gets on with people. And young children, of course, it's not quite their cup of tea. But in Mauritius and Malaysia, wherever I went in, 
Has it changed for you? Because before, you know, you could travel around, you come across an Indian, there's almost that natural gravitational pull. And it's like, great, tell me more about you. Why are you yeah. here? And you're almost like long distant family. But have yeah, you that, noticed that, that a change in that? has diminished over the years. One, because people have become more cosmopolitan. People are traveling wow. more. The world has become much smaller than it was. And yeah. therefore, that, that human, that Indian thing we had in the past has definitely diminished substantially. In fact, I can guarantee if I go to Barbados now, which I have been to, and it's very different. Or anywhere, you know, people are. There are communities who welcome you. Uh, as a stranger or as a countryman, you know, but that has definitely diminished. Definitely, you know, that I think life has moved on, the world has become small. This, this, these guys have traveled, yeah. In those days, travel was you know, I'm totally talking 30 years ago, travel was very rare compared to now. You know, all this uh, travel has been made very, very much cheaper with these uh, commercial airlines, you know, the cheaper airlines coming online, and they've made the, the world very small, hasn't they? Haven't they? Yeah. And you know, the whole world has traveled a lot more in the last 30 years than they ever did in the previous three, four, five hundred years, you know? Yeah, it's, and our exposure to one another has changed dramatically. And also, also the warmth has gone, has diminished, yeah. The warmth of people towards each other has definitely diminished. I don't, I don't see the same warmth as I used to. Oh, VG, you're being a Debbie Downer right now, aren't you? It's like, <laughs> no. What would you define as this notion of Indianness then? Because I'm an Indian. As you see, you hear me, I'm talking to you, and uh, you won't see anything non Indian in me, except that I live here. I do business in that etiquette. I have a lot of English friends who are terrific guys, but my home is a complete Hindu home. You know, we take our shoes off when we enter the house. Yeah. You know, where she was in the house, you know. And uh, my mom used to live with me all this till all my entire life. And she was still the head of the family when she passed away. So, yeah. And then, you know, my family, like my brother, I'm very, very close to him. You know, we are in business together. Yeah. For the last 40 odd years. Since we started, we've been together. I started the business and he joined me some five, seven years later. He's an architect, but he joined the pharma business with me. And there's absolutely never and touch wood, never a dispute with the family about money or business or share, nothing, nothing, nothing. We work, we know each other's strengths and weaknesses and we just work to that. Well, <laughs> and one, it's fine, one, you know, I think families generally, you know, then even now of Indian family, there's a lot of rows and they're separate and all that. My family is not that, really touching wood everywhere I can. <laughs> we are very, very close and the second generation are in the business. And they're running the show with us and on their own as well now because it's a global business we are in. And each, you know, fortunately, our kids were very nicely educated. And they, again, it, you know, uh, they went to go to university, they're professionals. They've done stint in their own industry, like one's a medic who's been in hospital training as a consultant. Then he left the business, the medical business, to come in our business, which is related, of course. Yeah. The other son is an accountant. He worked for BDO, Merrill Lynch, Deutsche Bank for a few years as a banker. Then he came in the family business. My brother's daughter is a lawyer. She's a very bright girl. She qualified at Oxford. Yeah, Oxford. Yeah. Anyway, and she worked in the corporate finance for yeah. the Magic Circle. And now she's in there. So, you know, we've got a nice team of very capable kids who are taking on the business. And it's a fairly large business well, now. Vij, would you have been able to do this if you didn't come, if you had not arrived in the UK, do you think? Do you think the UK is what shaped you? No, I think you? it has been a, no, Rajan, it's a fair question. The UK has been an amazingly, an amazingly accommodating country. And if you want to work hard and you want to succeed, and this has been very fertile ground, incredible. The only thing is when you first start, you know, and I tell you, when I first started my business, I wanted 6,000 pounds loan. And I had been qualified a year. So I went to every bank on the high street, Barclays, it used to be National Westminster, Lloyds. It used to be called not Royal Bank of Scotland, it was the National Westminster Bank. And there was the Lloyds there as well, I think. I went to all these banks, and every time after presenting my case, and I was 26 years old, and I said, there you go, I want uh, 
six thousand. When you start my business, this is the proposal. You know, everyone said, "You have got enough experience. You have got enough collateral. Come back when you have those two." And I wanted to tell the balance. I said, "How am I going to have experience if you don't give me a leg up?" <laughs> hmm? And I didn't. And they didn't. You know, this is it. Then an uncle of mine took me to a bank, Indian Bank, the State Bank of India, was the Bank of Baroda, Indian Bank. They gave me the money because he guaranteed it, not that they were going to give me 6,000 pounds. And he guaranteed it and took a quarter share in my business for that. And he didn't pay a penny, he just guaranteed the money and I got the loan, got the business started. And you know, within the first year, I doubled the business. And then within the following year, I doubled it again. <laughs> and uh, Parkless Bank came running along because I was in touch with them all the time. You see, you know, yeah. I know my hands were tied, etc. And they said, how much money do you want? <laughs> well, I was paying the Indian bank 6% over life, 6% over base, which was criminal. Yeah. You know, they just were coming 6% over base. And in those days, when I started in 1974, 75, the it was 10 or 11%. So I was paying 16% interest. Wow. And Barclays gave me money at 3% over base. I moved all my business there. But then, you know, I never look back. They could, they, to, till today, I'm, in fact, I was at dinner with uh, their CEO. And uh, he said, you know, one of the bankers said, you know, he's our oldest client. I've been with them for 40 plus years that evening. He said, wow, he said, wow. yeah, I should have a picture of you. It's <laughs> what it was from a 6,000 pound loan to what they're lending into hundreds of millions today. Yeah. And no problem how much I want because they know it's your money. I paid them maybe 200 of their loans back successfully. So there you go. Now we obviously have the multi multiple banking and all that. Yeah. yeah well, so. well there's, there's one thing that we spoke about on the phone that I want to touch on is this pride of identity. And you said when you first came to the UK, it was, it was quite a tough because the confidence in who you were had it, had had it shaped as of yet. You are very perceptive, Rajan. I must give you that. You made a note of what really my anxieties were and you brought that up. Yeah. What it was, was, listen, you are a guy who has walked in from Kenya. You have never been to England. You're in a strange country, in a country that's not yours, where you're not born and brought, and that you're living amongst my population. The population is very, very different to you. And I don't, I never felt unwelcome. At the same time, I never felt welcome. I yeah. couldn't knock on somebody's door and ask, oh, mate, I'm lost here, can you help me? You know, I couldn't, I didn't have the confidence. I didn't have the confidence in all fairness to walk into a five-star hotel like the Hilton or the Paris. I just would think, what if someone asked me what I'm doing here? Because I didn't have a penny in my pocket. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and I didn't have the confidence to walk in one of those institutions. No way. And so, you know, I had to get that over a period of time when I, when one realizes, that, you know, these people are good. These people are accommodating. What a fantastic episode, I'm sure you agree. Now, if you like that, you will like part two for sure. But going back onto some of the moments there with VJ, the things that I think stand out incredibly well is, you know, the power that our parents, our guardians have on us is not the words that go with us, it's the actions. Those things that really start to change the fabric of how we feel, the way that we think, and the way we start to relate to the global world and the global environment around us. And in Vijay's case, it's been the cornerstone of their success. You know, the mother's integrity going through some of the most harshest conditions in that time, becoming a widow at a very young age with the children that you have to look after, and then working tirelessly to not only provide them with an education and with some form of finances but more importantly the ethical and moral duty to do well for all those around you that i think is truly remarkable i think something that definitely warrants a lot more attention in now as always if you listen to this on youtube or by podbean or any other platforms make sure you like you subscribe and you share because ultimately what we're doing is creating a living encyclopedia that connects our entire community together. Also, if you have a story that you'd like to share, make sure you touch base with us via Instagram or Facebook, where you can find my personal tag at the Nazarans, and you can send me over some content, things that you think are important for us to talk about, or even your personal story as well. 
Now in part two, VJ goes deeper, he plunges really into this human experience of being a person of Indian origin. Keeping in mind, he was a traveler far before I was born. He had been out there to these incredible countries prior to this rising technology and he got to meet with the local communities there. So in part two, we have a closer look in terms of what does Indianness mean? How do we relate to each other and has that changed the very fabric of our communities? Also, we have a look at the big question posed. India means something to us, but do we really mean anything to India? And what more can we do together? It is a remarkable conversation that looks into business in terms of human motivations, but also this incredible kaleidoscope of Indianness. So make sure you tune in. It'll be coming out tomorrow from today's date, which is the 15th of the month, 2020. If you've listened to this via Podbean or via the social media channels like YouTube, make sure you subscribe and then the next one will automatically come in or go back into the library if you listen to this at a later date. Until we speak, I hope all remains well. Fantastic time to be alive, isn't it? Speak to you soon.